All right, now we're ready to go. Um, excited to be here today to share with you uh, my ideas on the future of work. Um, I founded a company called TaskRabbit, which was at the very beginning of the sharing economy. We really pioneered the industry way back in 2008. So I'm going to share that story with you and how the sharing economy has really emerged and catapulted the future of work into where it is today and where I see it going over the next decade. So first, just a little bit about me, because I think it helps to provide context on where I see the future of work going, if you can understand what my frame of the, fu of the past of work has been. So I grew up in a very small town in Shirley, Massachusetts. Population was 4,000. There was not even a stoplight in my town. My dad worked for the Air Force for over 30 years before he retired, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. So that is my framework for, the, for work growing up. I always wanted to be a ballerina when I was growing up, either that or an astronaut. I couldn't decide. And so I ended up at a women's college in Virginia called Sweetbriar College, which has an incredible liberal arts program. And it was there that I was able to major in math, computer science, and then minor in dance. My first jobs growing up um, were in four, I guess, four categories. So I started when I was 16 years old, probably one of my favorite jobs as a bank teller. I worked at Shirley Cooperative Bank in the middle of town. All the townspeople would come in with their little you know, cardboard board books, and I would do their transactions for them and, and leave them with printed receipts. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I did that all through college as I was going through Sweetbriar. And then after I came out with my math and computer science degree, I got my first what I would call real job um, at IBM. I actually started at a smaller company called Iris Associates, which were the original developers of Lotus Notes and Domino, if anyone has ever used those products. Uh, Lotus bought Iris, then IBM bought Lotus, and so I got merged into IBM pretty quickly, and I spent eight years there as a software engineer. Eight years in, I had the idea for TaskRabbit, which I'll share with you in a moment how that story came to be. And I spent eight years at TaskRabbit founding, scaling that company as CEO before I transitioned my role to executive chairwoman about 18 months ago. And then I just started sort of the next chapter of my career as an early stage investor investing in consumer internet and technology companies. And this is an area where I hope to dedicate the next decade and beyond. So the story of TaskRabbit, it started with a dog. This is Kobe. He, um, he's a yellow lab. He's 110 pounds. And it was a very cold winter night in Boston, February of 2008. My husband and I, we were sitting in our kitchen. We were getting ready to go out to dinner when we realized we were out of dog food. And we kept Kobe here very well fed. My husband is also in technology, so we would always have these very geeky conversations in the house. And that night it turned into, wouldn't it be nice if there was just a place online we could go, say we needed dog food, name the price we're willing to pay. We were certain that there was someone in our own neighborhood that'd be willing to pick this up for us. We were certain that there was probably someone at the store, and it was just a matter of connecting with them. But February of 2008 was the dark ages. There was no app store. The iPhone had just come out a few months earlier. And so no one was building on these location-based location technologies. No one was leveraging social to build on top of Facebook and create new applications. And so it was really, really early. But I saw these technologies emerging. And as an engineer, I became really passionate about how I could mash up social, mobile, and location technologies to connect real people in the real world to get real things done. In the past couple years, that's become in real time. And so even before the cab came to pick us up at our house in Boston and take us across town to meet friends for dinner, I grabbed my iPhone and I said, OK, if such a site existed, what would it be called? And the first thing I came up with was runmyerrand.com. <laughs> 
I bought the name on the spot. I hated it 20 minutes later, but I thought, let's just kind of see if this, is, if this is at all a product, if this is a business, if this is a company before I start obsessing about the name. And so four months later, from that very night in February, I decided to quit my job at IBM. I cashed out a $28,000 pension that I had, and that really uh, bankrolled the first year of the TaskRabbit idea. Locked myself in my house for about 10 weeks straight over that summer, and then got TaskRabbit launched in September of 2008. So I took the idea from one neighborhood in Boston, Charlestown, which I was living in at the time, scaled it up over the course of the next almost decade, nine years, all over the US, 44 cities, two countries. London was our first international market. We have 60,000 taskers on the platform that are making money. Um, and it is true, IKEA just acquired us uh, last week, which is incredibly exciting. And I think it speaks a lot to, as well, the future of work and how strategic partners, such as IKEA and others, are think about, thinking about integrating these new ways of working into their strategic business plans as well. So the future of work is changing. And it's changing pretty rapidly. I mean, it's been almost a decade since the sharing economy emerged. It's interesting to think back to those, those years in 2008 and 2009 before people were using terms like the sharing economy. But this was about the same time like companies like Airbnb, Uber, Lyft. We had all kind of started to emerge around the same time. There are a couple reasons for that. One is there was a very tough economic climate happening in 2008 and 2009. I didn't see this coming. I quit my job at IBM in April of that year. But by September, the stock market had crashed. People were being laid off. It turned out to be a necessary time to have a company like TaskRabbit where people were trying to find new ways of working and trying to find ways to make ends meet. Another reason why this was a great time is because the technology had finally caught up to where we could actually start to mimic human behaviors, where we could start to build on top of location awareness, on top of messaging, on top of payments, and leverage these technologies to connect real people in the real world in real time. Now, back in 2008 and 2009, uh, before the word the sharing economy existed, it really became prevalent in 2010. Investors, in particular, were still worried that this was a fleeting trend, like, oh, interesting, you know, Airbnb, you might rent uh, a room out in your home, or wow, in 2008 and 2009, there's no way you would jump into a stranger's car and drive across town. So these ideas were very early, and some investors thought, well, as, as the economy improves, then we're going to start to see the decline of these companies. This is just a fleeting trend, these peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. But that's not what happened at all. In fact, we saw an increase in the number of companies that took on this peer-to-peer -peer model. And we saw a true emergence of these freelance economy workers trying to not only make ends meet, but were helping redefine what was important to them, helping redefine the future of work, and helping to prioritize what they valued in work. So what we're starting to see today, almost a decade in, is the emergence of next-gen HR platforms. So you might be familiar with platforms like Sequoia or Trinet, who have done very well in this space. But one area that I'm seeing a lot of innovation in is in these platforms that are wrapping around these sharing economy companies. Now think about it. I mentioned at the beginning that when I started TaskRabbit, there was no app store, that the iPhone had just come out. But there was no platform that was allowing companies and applications to build quickly on top of the iPhone and then get those applications launched in the App Store. If you take that analogy and apply it to where we are today with the sharing economy, it's almost as if these companies, Airbnb and TaskRabbit and Lyft is up and others, are the apps on top of something that doesn't quite exist yet. 
there's a whole underlying supply platform here that really hasn't been fully integrated and fully tapped into. So one area that I'm watching closely as an investor now is are there companies, are there innovations that are going to tackle this massive opportunity, certainly a billion dollar plus market, where you can incorporate the vetting, the payments, the insurance, the benefits, the paid time off, all of these things that uh, a traditional W-2 employee would naturally receive from their employer. But in this new age, in this new world of freelancing, how can we wrap and provide some infrastructure for these workers as well? So there's three key areas that I'm going to walk you through today that I think have really influenced um, the future of work. The first is flexibility. The first is autonomy. And the last we'll go through is fulfillment. But starting off with flexibility. So we surveyed uh, our 60,000 taskers. And we asked them, what is important to you when you are finding work on the platform? Is it money? Is it re-entry into the workforce? Uh, or is it something else? In an overwhelming number, almost 60% of our taskers said flexibility was the number one priority for them in finding work on our platform. In fact, 34% of Americans today consider themselves freelance workers. There's a whole underlying economy here that has been around for decades. And the sharing economy companies are starting to converge with these freelance economies that have been around. A lot of people might say, well, yeah, you founded TaskRabbit, and it was a tough economic climate. And I'm sure a lot of these workers were, were unemployed or, or they couldn't find work. And so they turned to your platform. And that just isn't the case. We have such a wide variety of people that become taskers on the platform. And I know that companies like Lyft and Airbnb see some of the same trends. We have stay-at-home moms that are out running errands anyway and don't mind picking things up for people. We have this amazing group of retirees that have had full work experiences and full careers but want to stay active and want to have the flexibility of picking up jobs when and where they want. We have young professionals that are looking to make ends meet, maybe nights and weekends, and supplement their incomes. In fact, almost 40% of our taskers left full-time work and chose to work on a more flexible platform like TaskRabbit. So the next few slides I'm going to walk you through really, I think, hit home around this flexibility point. Um, this is a company that I recently did an investment in. It's very early days. But it is a flexible jobs marketplace. So the point here is that flexibility is one of the key ingredients in how people prioritize work. And so to offer a marketplace and a platform where not only companies can go to find employees that want flexible roles, but candidates can come and say, here are my parameters. Here are the flexible schedule I'm looking for. What are the roles? What are the companies that I can get matched with? You can think of this like a monster.com or an indeed.com, but all focused around flexible labor pools. It's pretty interesting because when you think about the dynamics at play here, uh, there's a lot of talk right now about the lack of diversity in leadership roles, particularly gender diversity, in the higher ranks of any organization, sort of director level, VP level, and above. Uh, a lot of women are falling out of the workforce uh, due to having children or taking different career paths. There's a whole new generation of millennials that have come to expect flexibility as part of their normal framework for work. And then technology, again, is at a time where it's making things like remote work, telecommuting, uh, different technology software platforms and tools easily accessible. Collaborative tools are enabling people to work from anywhere. A lot of companies are seeing utilizing a platform like work as a way to win the war on talent. So everything is becoming so competitive. And being able to offer flexible frameworks for jobs allows you to attract more women, where flexibility is the number one factor in a lot of women's job searches. 
It's the number three factor for, for millennials, and all employees value this. So it's a way for Fortune 500s to really get the best candidates. And let's be honest, work isn't working for all women. When you look at these statistics, they're staggering. 59% of college graduates are women, but less than 5% of them are in top leadership roles in companies. 30% of talented women are dropping out of the workforce, but 70% of those women said that they would stay if they could work in a more flexible environment. So work's whole thesis is that creating this flexible jobs marketplace is gonna be the highest ROI and the lowest cost to offer to bridge this gap for women, millennials, and beyond. So what's really clever is not only have they created this job marketplace, but they've also created a new language to talk about flexibility. And this is what got me really excited uh, as an investor because I really appreciate this innovation. So there's six different ways that you can either post for jobs or look for jobs on this platform. The first is you want to work remotely. So pretty straightforward. That's a framework that we're all used to. Desk plus. This means that you're partially office-based. So you have a desk in the office, but you can also work from home. Travel light is for those of us who may not want to do a lot of traveling. Um, so something that's more home-based. They've got micro agility where you can come in late, you can leave early. There might be inconsistencies in your schedule. You might work in the middle of the night some days. You might work during the day others. You might work on the weekends other weeks. It just depends on what's needed for your schedule. Time sh shift is a more consistent way of working. You know, it's not the normal 9 to 5, but it could be 12 to 8. It could be 6 to 2. And then part-time as well, being able to stay uh, engaged in work on a part-time basis, but not have to give up that uh, full-time advancement career track in your job. So innovations like these, I think, are really interesting. They address not only um, what we're seeing as important for the sharing economy as far as flexibility goes, but also this new generation of millennials coming into the workforce and certainly women and others as well. Now, those of you that could be skeptical around flexibility in the, the flexiverse, as I just shared with you, I found some interesting statistics. It's uh, a recent case study done uh, that shows uh, from a professor, economics professor at Stanford that for employees that are working from home, they're actually more productive. Their attrition rates are 50% lower. They have higher job satisfaction. And this statistic was really interesting. They actually were able to increase their productivity by 13.5%, which is an entire extra day of work a week. So that's pretty neat. So you might say, okay, flexibility, that all sounds great. It works for the sharing economy. It works for, you know, this case study we just looked at, this flexible jobs marketplace. But what about the robots that are going to take over the world? I know that's what you're thinking. I think it too sometimes. Um, it's true. It's true that 40% of jobs in the next 15 years are going to be vulnerable to automation. So what does that mean for the future of work in the workforce of today? Well, I think instead of the army of robots that I just showed you, it's probably going to look more like this. I believe that the future of work from an autonomous standpoint is going to speak to the opportunity for human and AI interaction to partner together to move innovation forward. I love this quote by Tim O'Reilly. I think it really speaks to the opportunity where we're able to utilize technology to augment workers so that we can do things that were never possible before. That's incredibly exciting, but it can also be really scary because if you're working in a job for 30 years that you've done for 30 years and then all of the sudden there's some augmentation, there's some other virtual reality that's gonna come in and start doing what you're doing, where does that leave you? And so that leads me to think about how the past of work is so much different than the future of work and how there's such a ripple effect 
in, across our industry, not just in work, but in education and retirement as well. This is circa 1982. I think I was probably three or four years old in this picture. I mentioned my father worked uh, in the Air Force for 30 years. And I think, you know, when I think about the past to work, it's sort of this typical flow. You went to school, you got your first job, maybe you got a second job, and then you stayed there for 30 years and you retired. That's certainly how I grew up and what I saw my father do. Now, the future of work, I think, is a little bit more like a matrix than a ladder. You may go to school, you may get your first job, your second job, maybe a third job. Maybe you start to think about what are my hobbies, what are some side jobs I can do, is there any freelancing? Maybe I need to be retrained because technology has moved so fast. And then you start to realize that our entire education system moving forward is going to be changed and affected by the future of work. Enter companies like Galvanize as one example. Galvanize is a campus-based platform. There are eight campuses all over the country that are focused on uh, retraining or helping adults mid-careers change into the technology industry. So they actually even do workforce retraining for large companies like IBM who need their workforces to stay current and stay up to date. So meet Tossin. He's here in this picture. He uh, has a hobby as a freelance photographer and a musician, very talented. He had been working many years on a freelance basis, picking up jobs here and there and different gigs. But as he started to grow his family with a baby on the way, he decided, you know what, I want to get something that's a little bit more steady, a little bit more focused, maybe pays a little bit more as well. And so he started to look into different programs and opportunities that he could uh, get himself educated in. So he looked at the program at Galvanize, and it was a big leap for him. It's a, the program that Tossin did was a six-month commitment. Can you imagine saying, I'm going to focus for six months. I'm not going to take on any other work. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to get trained as a web developer. And in six months, I'm placing this massive bet on myself that I'm going to switch careers. And I'm going to get full-time work as a web engineer. But that's just what he was able to do. So after six months of this program, he was able to go out in Austin and get a job at a technology company, which very excitingly, was focused on music. And so he was able to find the perfect fit for him and really change the trajectory of his career, change the trajectory of his work, and change the trajectory of his family as well. So as I think about how the future of work is changing, you also have to think about how the education system is going to have to change as well. How are we educating our workers? How are we retraining our employees to keep up with the fast pace of what's happening today? This leads me to the last um, key area that I wanted to share with you today around fulfillment. And when I think about the future of work, I can't think about the future of work without thinking about the privilege that we all have as professionals, as managers, and helping our employees and helping our team members find success at work. Because that's something that's never going to change. Being able to feel like you're making an impact in finding success in your everyday job is something that will continuously be important to this workforce and beyond. So the one thing I like to think about when I think about success at work is a lot of people talk about winning. I just really want to win that deal. I really want to hit those revenue numbers. I really want to get those milestones and those metrics and those targets. Winning can be defined as putting points on the board, winning a game. But I find that success is the most important thing, is the ultimate goal. So success can be defined as winning, having uh, hit those revenue numbers, having hit those milestones, but also includes things like, did you operate with purpose? Did you have an impact? What are the core values of the team that you've brought together? And did you operate with those values? 
I'll tell you a story um, of a company, I think, that uh, embodies this analogy between success and winning. There was a company that had a huge sales force. And uh, all of the sales folks wanted to set really aggressive goals uh, for the quarter. And so the manager said, OK, we want you all to increase your sales go goals by 30% this quarter. And if you hit those goals at the end of the quarter, then you will have won. And you know, we'll, we'll keep driving forward as a team. Well, about halfway through the quarter, six weeks in, all the sales folks, they were working really hard. They were working nights and weekends. They were making all their calls. But they were, and they were getting some traction, but they weren't going to hit the 30% increase in goal. So what did they do? Well, they started to do things like overbill customers, or maybe they recommended work that didn't actually need to be done. And at the end of the quarter, they actually were able to hit their numbers. They won for that quarter, and upper management was really happy and really excited. But this wasn't a model that was sustainable. They weren't successful. And in the end, that company wasn't going to be successful for the long term. I believe you can succeed without winning at times, even though it's really fun to win. And I believe that you can win, but not be successful in a sustainable way. So in closing, the sharing economy over the last decade has really emerged and, and driven the future of work in a way that I think is pretty unprecedented. We're going to see changes in infrastructure to support these workers, like these next-gen HR platforms that I spoke with you about. We're going to see a lot of innovation around the flexible job marketplaces and flexible work, which I think benefits uh, not only women, uh, but all workers across our industries. And then it's also important to think about how we prepare our employees and how we prepare our workers and how the education system of the future is going to have to adapt and change to how work is changing. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, if you guys want to line up at the mics, happy to take questions. Not sure if, there oh, we go. There you go. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm with Imager. I'm the VP of people there based in San Francisco. And um, first of all, thank you so much for that. Uh, in our latest engagement survey, we actually found that uh, if you're a remote worker at Imager, you're almost twice as engaged than if you're in our headquarters in SF. And so um, this is something I'm super passionate about when I think about the VR, the, the generation that's growing up in VR where they can manipulate their environment and then asking them to graduate and take an eight to five job. It's just not going to happen. And we have to start preparing ourselves to adapt to, to this type of work culture and this type of work demand. And so my, my question for you is, um, just this past Friday, actually, at Imager, we rolled out a series of perks and benefits that start to encourage uh, more flexibility in the workplace. But as companies start doing this, what do you anticipate or what's your personal belief in terms of what is the biggest challenge and what can we do to try to overcome that? Great question. Thank you for your question. I think that the biggest challenge is going to be culture. Um, with distributed workforces, there's always, always the question of, can you maintain a company culture that will be cohesive, that will be co consistent? I believe that company culture is one of the most important things um, that we can build within a team. And I think it goes back to that operating with purpose and impact and values and finding success at work that really gets people fulfilled. Um, and really speaks to fulfillment. So I think that'll probably be the biggest challenge, but I think you're right that with uh, new technologies emerging around VR, around AI, there are gonna be opportunities that help build uh, sustainable cultures in a remote way as well that we haven't even seen yet. So I think it's really, really exciting. Thank you for your question. Hi Leah, thanks for your time. Uh, my name's Yasmin, I'm at Logic Monitor, we're in Santa Barbara. 
And I was curious with this with this new way of working where it's kind of like these quick hits, everyone has this flexible feel to it. As recruiters, we're always looking for people that we can retain and that will be engaged. So what do you think the future of talent acquisition and recruiting will be affected by this change? Great question. I think one thing to think about is, is there a way to give workers what they want around flexibility per job, but also look at them on a broader platform? And is there a way that you can create an infrastructure that retains the relationship with that worker, that employee, but allows them the flexibility to move around to, maybe it's a lot of different jobs, or maybe it's a lot of um, different structures of work, maybe it's different hours. Um, but I think there are probably opportunities to rethink how staffing agencies interact and create relationships with their workers in a way that also helps those workers get what they want around the flexibility point as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank it's you. a bit of a mind bend to think about this new way, so it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Your last question touched a little bit on this. My name is Lisa. I work for Vacasa. We're a professionally managed vacation rental company. Uh, we have about 1,700 employees. We're based in Portland, Oregon, but we're all over the world. Um, so we employ all of our housekeepers, which is a big differentiator for us because in terms of that guest experience, that's the first point of contact and we want that to be amazing. We want to be able to create amazing training that creates that experience. That being said, we have a lot of surges in terms of, you know, in the busy season and so forth. Um, that really is tough to get talent. We're in a lot of remote, remote areas. Um, so something like, you know, task rabbit type of thing is really great. However, how do you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you bridge that gap in terms of the restrictions from an HR perspective of training employees and, you know, providing benefits and so forth, but still having that flexibility. Yeah, it's such a great question. <laughs> something that is top of mind and highly debated all the time um, at TaskRabbit, and I'm sure at a lot of the other sharing economy companies as well. So, uh, you know, the benefit at TaskRabbit is that we can have this broad, wide-ranging workforce, uh, which enables us to be able to deliver uh, in real time, because we have so much liquidity in a marketplace. Someone can come on and say, I need a house cleaner to be here in an hour. And we have so much liquidity in that market because we have so many people, we can deliver that on-demand experience. The challenge is, because they're all distributed workers and 1099 contractors, we can't provide the training programs that I'm sure you guys do. So we have to think about other ways that we can create a consistent, high-quality experience for our customers. Now, the way we think about this is, um, there's actually an entirely separate Tasker app that's separate from the TaskRabbit app. And all of our Taskers download this application. And inside the application, um, there's a little bit of uh, what you might call gamification around performance metrics, uh, responsiveness, response time. Um, you know, they're able to start and stop jobs, so hourly tracking, payments. And so being able to provide infrastructure and tools that enable taskers not only to um, do their work and do it quickly and efficiently, but then also to provide feedback around ratings and reviews and try to offer um, some, some gamification around their performance and quality. You know, it helps, um, but it, it doesn't get us all of the way there. And that, I think, is um, sort of the interesting challenge that all of these sharing economy companies face. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to go? Oh. Hi, my name is Victoria Rourke. I'm from Deloitte. Uh, thank you so much for speaking, feeling very inspired and had the wheels turning based on your uh, talk. Um, I have a question uh, more around regarding recruiting, particularly in professional services companies or at technology companies. I know a lot of the a sharing economy has been based around the gig economy, particularly with TaskRabbit, um, but wanted to get your thoughts around trends in more of the traditional corporate workplaces and how can we drive conversations, especially as recruiters, with hiring managers or even at a more macro level to say, you know, let's get away from the butts and seats mentality. When we post this job, how can we put some of those pre-negotiated flexibility terms in there? So want to hear your thoughts about the more traditional workplace environment there. Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I think that's why I got so excited about this, this company, Work, out of New York City. It's two women that founded this flexible job marketplace. 
Um, one of them is an ex-consultant, I believe, from Deloitte. Um, but they're co-CEOs, which is kind of interesting, too. They share the CEO job and title because there's so much flexibility in what they're building. Um, I think that creating a language and creating a framework is a great first step to talk about what is needed as far as flexibility is concerned in the workplace. Um, so I love that they've created this language and this framework that if they can consistently roll it out to these Fortune 500 companies, then it becomes um, you know, this, this sort of certification or this badge that these companies have. And it also empowers um, employees and workers to be able to have these conversations with their hiring managers or with their HR professionals in a way that doesn't make them feel ashamed or scared or, you know, um, getting if you're getting ready to have your first child, that can be a really scary time for a woman in the workforce. And particularly if she's on, you know, a management track role and she's a director or above and it's scary to think like, oh, I'm going to leave the workforce for three months and take this leave and then what's going to happen after that? And so I just love that they're providing a framework to have these discussions. I think it's really empowering for both the company and um, the employee to have this common language. Yes. All right, so is this working yet? Okay, fantastic. So uh, my name is Jim McCall. I actually work at IKEA Group. Um, yeah, I know, right? Um, and I love the fact that we have uh, TaskGrab as part of our new portfolio coming up. And listening to you talk about the shared economy, thinking about the gig economy, and thinking about retail specifically, and the pressures that are faced on the online side of things, um, in our stores, it's very easy to say it's super flexible, as long as you can work every night and you can work on weekends. Um, <laughs> And in the traditional corporate environment where if you're an accountant, you can do that anywhere you have a laptop and internet. If you're a recruiter, you can do that anywhere with a laptop and internet. Mm -hmm. You can't meet our customers in our stores anywhere with a laptop and an internet. And how do you see that dynamic playing out um, in the gig economy going into the future with less and less people trafficking retail stores and less and less people wanting to stay in retail? Um, you know, retail turnover is 30, 40, 50% in com some companies. Mm -hmm. And IKEA is ranked as one of the highest, and we're still pretty high. Mm -hmm. So where do you think that infrastructure, as we think about shared economy and the gig economy, what do you think are some of the base needs that we kind of have to tackle, both from a recruiting side, but also just from a core structure side? Great question. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Particularly, <laughs> I mean, from a retail standpoint, I, retail is, is changing. The future of work is changing. Retail is changing. Um, they're certainly intertwined, but those are Two, two big topics. Um, the one thing that I'm seeing uh, from having partnered TaskRabbit with companies like Ikea, with Amazon, with others, is that all of these big strategic partners are looking for ways to tackle their digital strategy. They see that um, the brick and mortar, you know, moving forward is shifting, is changing. So it changes how they staff those locations but it also, it also changes how they provide services to their end customers. So many of the partnerships that we found success with at TaskRabbit have been providing sort of these add-on services to goods that have been purchased either in a store or online. So you can imagine through Amazon, someone orders a flat screen TV. If you're an Amazon customer doing that purchase, wouldn't you like it not only delivered, but installed the next day? And Amazon is not in a place where they're going to, you know, hire all of these full-time um, service professional workers. And so they're partnering with companies like TaskRabbit and others, by the way, to provide these add-on services. I think what's interesting there is being able to provide a crowdsourced services marketplace, again, drives that liquidity that's needed to be able to um, serve up uh, a person and a skill in real time. So you're thinking about location, you're thinking about category, um, and you're, you're able to make those matches in real time only because it is a full crowdsource marketplace. So that's sort of one side of the equation. The other side to your question is, if you're an employee in those stores, you know, 
working nights and weekends <laughs> in a flexible way. Um, how's that going to impact you? I think what I'm seeing is that more and more um, uh, retailers, particularly if they have to scale up their workforces, like around the holidays or if there's some seasonality involved, they're, they're trying to find um, these part-time, more flexible solutions. So what I um, am seeing happening are these platforms, again, like these next-gen platforms that are providing a supply of, of individuals, of workers that can be plugged into a lot of different retailers, a lot of different channels, um, which allows not only the, the workers to have flexibility about where and when they work across maybe retailers and across stores, um, but then it also allows the stores to have some flexibility on how they scale up and scale down based on timing and seasonality and those sorts of things. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Looks like that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. It's really fun.